The session theme, what we have is uh, accelerating entrepreneurship in Asia. And the theme itself is, is very, very exciting. Uh, I only noticed one thing. Uh, this is a panel which is all men. So I think lacks a little bit of inclusion. Uh, I wish there was uh, a woman entrepreneur also, also but uh, still, let's uh, move on. We have the panelists from uh, different countries in their own way. They have all excelled in their own fields. And uh, I'm sure they will have a lot of good insights to share. And also uh, maybe a bit about their own experience and uh, how do they look at the government or the society supporting the entrepreneurship ecosystem. If we take a macro look, I think uh, creating jobs and supporting economic development is the priority for all the governments. And historically, accelerating the enterprise development has been the model to support jobs and also to support growth. And that is how this session makes a lot of sense. for the governments to look at the models which have worked in different parts of the world. If you look at the composition, I think the entire corporate sector, 98% is the SMEs. And SMEs create jobs, they create wealth, they bring equality and they also support the services industry. If you look at the factors in terms of uh, having the ecosystem which is right to support the enterprise, the entrepreneurs, I would like to flag off some of the issues which probably we can discuss. The first issue is whether we should look at the global models which have worked elsewhere. Like many countries have tried to replicate the Silicon Valley. Now, whether that works or you should look at the local conditions, the local markets, and try to have your own models which will suit your needs and the local ecosystem. The second theme could be, while you look at the new industries, you attract FDIs, how do you balance supporting the existing industries? Because they are already there, they are there on the ground. They are creating jobs. They understand the markets. They may be able to scale up quite easily. The third theme is what should be the role of the private sector? Because government alone cannot do it. And government actually should not get into the management of doing all these things. So the private sector has a role to play to what extent and specifically what kind of role. The fourth theme could be 
the entire regulatory framework world bank ranks various countries on ease of doing business so governments have a role to play there to make it easier for the companies to set up to operate to comply with the norms the fifth theme could be the capital availability of capital at a reasonable cost a competitive cost again whether it should mean plenty of easy money does that help subsidies doles some people feel these things don't help in long term but again we can have some views also the social acceptance and the culture how the society looks at the corporates whether this look at them as the people a community who creates wealth or they look at them as a community which is exploiting the resources exploiting the environment climate whether the society celebrates entrepreneurship and the successes and the last theme could be innovation and r&d the entire framework and also the linkages between the institutions and the industry so i think uh, these are my thoughts and now we can move on to the panel here this is the broader framework but uh, feel free to to bring in newer points newer themes or the sub themes so i think uh, we could request david to share his thoughts thanks um it's my pleasure to be here in this panel and my name is david I'm from Taiwan. I'm the founder of Lambo. It's a, a lifestyle company uh, focusing on kitchen-related products and experiences. I have also um, found a tech startup back in 2013. We secured two early-stage funding, made the products, uh, launched it, but unfortunately, we uh, failed and closed last year. But back to the our, our topic today. Uh, when talking about entrepreneurs, so I would like to talk about what's the art archetype of entrepreneurs. In my mind, when talking about entrepreneurs, there are three major names that just pop up, like Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, and uh, Mark Zuckerberg. So, what are they in common? Um, they're both college dropouts, and um, they're young when they're starting up business. And they all claim that they build a business in their garage, and then they successfully turn their ventures into uh, multi-billion companies. So this kind of Cinderella story and so dramatic that people around the world, especially Silicon Valley, they embrace this idea and they praise young entrepreneurs. So um, like media, they write stories about them. Hollywood make films. Movies about them, and then eventually it affect the decision making of venture capital firms. So、um, they pour in money more to the firms that started out by young entrepreneurs. But、uh, it's not a fact statistically, because、uh, from a recent report from MIT and Northwestern University,、um, actually the average. Let me see the stats here. The average age of the fastest-growing tech startup founder is about 45 years old, which means the startups. I, I, I'm not meaning that the founder that opened a coffee shop in your neighborhood is a fast-growing tech startup. It's 45 years old, so it's pretty old. It's not young at all. And actually, they are these all entrepreneurs are twice as likely to build a successful startup as young entrepreneurs. Following up with some interesting fact,、um, 
a 50-year-old founder is 1.8 times more likely to achieve upper tail growth than a 30-year-old founder. And relative to founders who, with no relevant experience, those with at least three years of prior work experience in the same industry as their startup were 85% more likely to launch a highly successful startup. So with that in mind, here are my two cents about today's topics. I'm pretty focused on the innovation and education stuff. So I have four points. Um, the first one is to provide a lifelong education and training program for entrepreneurs over 40 years old. Uh, we all know that entrepreneurs over 40 years old, like they're old and they have they work several years. They have really good human capital. They 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 have social capital and they might um, pretty wealthy and financially independent. Um, but they are not d digital native as young entrepreneurs. So they are pretty lagged behind from the innovation adoption cycle. So uh, having a lot of courses that help them to learn new technology and adopt new technology or learning new, new things like programming, programming language, something can be helpful for innovation for the entire entrepreneurial ecosystem. This, the second thing is that um, to strengthen the current mentoring activity. Um, we have mentor right now, like offering by um, uh, incubators, accelerators right now, but they're pretty one way. So all entrepreneurs teaching young entrepreneurs their experiences. But I would like to suggest that maybe this could be like two ways, both ways, like reverse mentoring. So all entrepreneurs, we can change this structure. So all entrepreneurs can learn from young entrepreneurs. Um, they can learn from them like new technology. They can adopt new products to their own company. So which will eventually uh, improve the co company's communication or working efficiency. So um, the next one should be with the government. I, I think government should provide more tech in incentive for entrepreneurs over 40 years old because when we go old, we have more obligation, like family, kids, something like that, but um, which we might have some wonderful idea we, which can turn into a wonderful product, but this obligation might discourage us to, to st starting up our own business. So um, if we have some tax incentive to encourage these old entrepreneurs to start their own business, this would be very helpful for the ecosystem. Um, the last thing is to, I think, we should create a friendly trial and error environment for the entrepreneurs, which can be done by um, removing the current regulation that protecting the vesting interest groups. For example, like uh, FinTech technology is not very popular in Hong Kong because uh, Hong Kong's regulation is protecting the bank industry. So um, this kind of regulation, if can be removed, that will significantly boost the creativity of the local entrepreneurs. And also, government should uh, incorporate with some um, equity to provide more um, equity-free funding so the entrepreneurs can uh, invest those money into um, R&D and innovation. So uh, I believe strong startup ecosystem generally develop when both private and public support networks are in place. So founders too can turn their ideas into business. This is my part. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Eddie, could we request you? Hi, good morning. Um, it's still morning. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me here. Um, it's, my name is Eddie Chow. That's uh, from Singapore, originally from Hong Kong. And uh, I've been in Singapore for 25 years. So the, um, I started my first startup in uh, year 2000. I've been in a corporate for a while, and then um, uh, so in year 2000, sort of um, I made a decision at the age of 39, so you can guess how old I am now. So I started my start, first startup, and then um, so no U-turn, and um, so I started all together about six of them, and I exit two. 
And I also do angel investing, seed, seed investment with some friends and all that. So that is my little bit of my background. Um, the um, I have actually four things I would like to uh, bring forward. In fact, it's a question rather than I'm going to give an answer. <laughs> so it's really open to the floor and to, to, to discuss, debate and all that. First actually is about how to grow the talents advertised for taking risks. Um, the, in fact, uh, a lot of people saying that if you have an MBA, the chances are you probably won't start your own business because they know and they learn a lot about how to calculate risk. The more you learn, the more you know about the risk, the more you won't take the risk. So, and, uh, and, and that, uh, that's sort of like, uh, I don't know about the, 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 the audience here, whether you agree to that. Now, uh, of course, you know, there's a lot of innovation we expected in the future, um, and we see that that is like, I won't say like a tsunami, but it is uh, really quite a fair bit in the last 10 years. Partly it's because of the invention of mobile, the connectivity is a lot better. So a lot of internet things actually is happening. Uh, you will have, uh, sooner or later, you will have autonomous vehicle, you have robots and all these kind of things actually uh, will come in place and will affect our life. So that we not have a lot of talents actually continue this kind of innovation. Uh, so the challenge actually, how are we going to bring, that, bring those talents actually on board to become an entrepreneur? So my, that's my first question. Second, it is about the, uh, assuming that you have uh, started a, uh, a startup, uh, assuming that also not may not be intact, right? How are you going to get quality funding to see food from the seed round all the way to the late stage? Um, there's a lot of seed money, early stage investment money, Series A, but you know the the key it is there's not a lot in the late stage. What I'm saying it is those would be able to put in. Uh, an eight-digit, a nine-digit uh, type, or even ten-digit type of uh, investment for a startup. Um, so, uh, of course, you have seen deals like, I mean, Grab or Uber got billion-dollar investment. There's one out of, I don't know, million chance you will get this kind of things. Um, so, uh, it, it, it's quite a lot of a startup I have seen. It is uh, they probably. Uh, see that, you know, they, they, the company was stuck in the Series B stage. They cannot grow further without proper quality funding. So the third point actually is about, I think, you know, the other uh, speakers mentioned about that is about market accessibility within Asia. Uh, I will look at it, it's like within the hinterland, it is uh, six to eight hours freight time. Um, within Asia, uh, in the past, actually, a lot of startup, especially the tech startup, the, you know, the holy grail actually is to go, go and get something in America. Or, you know, the second best is in Europe. Uh, Asia market, it is too small for them for tech startup. But not in the last five years. The last five years, the, you know, the Epic Center actually is now back into Asia. So then, you know, the, 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 the situation, it is... Uh, in Asia, it is not homogeneous. The market is so heterogeneous. There's a lot of pockets. And just now you mentioned about there's a lot of regulation, you know, and you mentioned about, you know, whether uh, is it easier to get, uh, you know, to set up a business actually in, for example, in Vietnam or set up a business in Thailand. Even though within ASEAN, we're still talking and talking, you know. Um, there's a, a lot of uh, uh, different kind of hurdles, actually, it is to make a, setting up a company in Asia. It's not as easy as uh, a lot of people thought. So how are we going to make the, the Asian market more homogeneous for, for startup to, to call it as one market, right? The fourth point, actually, I want to raise is... Um, is it entrepreneurship mainly for tech? I think tech or high tech, deep tech, you name it, right, have been capturing a lot of limelight lately because they, capture, they got a lot of funding. But I don't believe that, you know, startup is just meant for technology. There's a lot of 
startup actually, there's even with food and beverage, they're doing quite well. But of course, they may not be able to get a billion dollar valuation. But I don't believe that, you know, the, the startup scenes or entrepreneurship is only be sort of like uh, for tech and for a few entrepreneurs. It has to be collectively built up, the ecosystems. So, and is entrepreneurship is only for those below 35. I started my first startup at 39 years old. Uh, I exit, I make some money. So, but currently, in fact, just now I, I, I went to uh, another session, it's called Youth Quick. Okay, Youth Quick. I don't know whether you heard of the terms, right? Earthquake, where this Youth Quick. So it is uh, the, the, there's the words of the year in Oxford Dictionary last year. You've quick. They mentioned many, many times people saying that the tsunami is coming, the earthquake is coming. There's a lot of youth actually is now is uh, leading the innovation journey, leading the innovation in uh, a lot of ways and all that. So they, uh, in some way, actually, is uh, they going to even impact our lifestyle? I'm not, uh, mine it is. I'm already over fifty. So if our lifestyle actually it is uh, probably will be changed by then, not the other way around. So uh, it is a big topic. And also, is entrepreneurship actually for male in general? Okay, my first five startup, there's no ladies as a co-founder. I have to admit. My latest startup in 2018, I got five co-founders. Okay, three are ladies. So I'm very glad to say that, three are ladies. And in fact, uh, my co-founder CEO, uh, it's a lady, and she was the, used to be the managing director for IBM, a very senior lady, and the CTO is also a lady, Michael Vanda, and the principal data scientist also is a lady. It's all highly, highly qualified. So I, I would say that, you know, probably it is a, a reflection point. It's about, you know, more and more ladies, and I hope want to see more ladies, but I don't know. I mean, the statistic here is not so promising. <laughs> so is it time, actually, we should have more ladies, actually, to come on board to lead the game? So uh, I think I will stop here and then want to listen to other people's, what do they say? Thank you, Eddie. Thank you for uh, making the point of the market access, because uh, most of the time, startups have good ideas, but they don't find a uh, place to experiment, to test, and to validate the idea. And also the issue of scalability and the acceptance. Uh, Jos, may we request you to? Jos is from Taiwan, founder and CEO at Windows Technology. I started uh, um, my startup journey in 2014 from Israel. I was a researcher at Tel Aviv University in Israel, and at the time, I did some great job, and then the uh, technology commercialized, and then I got my first investment. And due to some reasons, I moved back to Taiwan, and I started this company, and we do uh, medtech. We mainly uh, do uh, medical technology and in order to help people. From my observation, especially comparing Asia and uh, Israel, I, I realize, I mean, entrepreneurship is really an uh, issue related to culture. In, uh, like, uh, in Jewish culture, they have their uh, some features one of the features is that they are not afraid of mistakes. You look for their, I mean, history, and you realize that uh, it's all about how to survive. And from their point of view, to survive is the first thing in order to, I mean, uh, to run the, uh, I mean, to keep themselves, I mean, uh, survive and so on and so forth. So as a result, they are not afraid to say something which is different from others. They are not afraid of the like, uh, hierarchical structure. So like uh, we, when I was a researcher, 
in Israel, like all of our meetings at the time, we all fight, we all fought. And, but the fighting was not just for, I mean, arguing. Uh, it's mostly for finding out the best so solution. But uh, coming back to Asia, you know, our culture, I mean, especially uh, in, I mean, for example, in Taiwan, many young generations, they are afraid of making mistakes because of many pressures from, I mean, their friends and so on and so forth. I do think the same uh, situation in Korea and in Japan. I do think that is something that really hurdle, I mean, uh, entrepreneurship. And so uh, I do think uh, how are we going to allow, I mean, young generations to speak out instead of we speak, they listen. It's something that we need to learn as a senior. And I myself is 42. I'm still young <laughs> compared to the age of 45 as a founder of a medtech tech, uh, startup. But I still think that, uh, in, especially in Asia, nowadays I do see a lot of young talents who are younger than me. And I do think they could be very promising. But the main point is that, do we really give them an environment like uh, Jewish people, they give their people, I mean, a full freedom to speak out. I mean, like my daughters, they born in Israel. They are more like Israelis <laughs> than Taiwanese. <laughs> they are very rude <laughs> and straightforward, but I like very much. The point is that quite often I listen to them, I, I learn, I mean, some good points that they share with me. I mean, the, uh, one of the lessons they learned from the uh, kindergarten in Israel was like fighting. <laughs> in Israel, everyone fights in order to, I mean, survive. That's the way they, uh, I mean, they, are, uh, they have now. But the point is that when they fight, they do learn something. For example, they know their strengths in the society. They know, I mean, who are the boss in the circumstance. And they also learn how to communicate with each other. And this is something that I uh, do in my mind. In Asia, we do need to have a culture allow young generation to speak out, whether we as senior to speak, they listen. Thank you very much. Okay. So the freedom to express. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hironori, could we proceed? Hi. Uh, uh, so, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for uh, inviting me as a partner. I'm, it's very great pleasure for me. And um, I'm from Librite Partners. Uh, let me describe two um, characteristics uh, for Librite Partners. Um, first one is we are as a first and only Japanese independent venture capital exclusively investing in Asia. I, I mean, we also, are we invested in India and also Southeast Asia? And we are actually eight years ago, eight years ago, um, 2012, uh, 2010 or 2011, we started investing in Indonesia. Then now we are covering uh, Malaysia, uh, Singapore and Thailand, and also uh, our primary target at the current moment is India. So um, why only Japanese uh, investment fund? venture capital investing in Asia. Some of the independent venture capitals and some of the large Japanese corporate venture capital fund, they are investing also, looking also for Silicon Valley, looking also for uh, Israel. So we are exclusively looking for and investing in Asia. And the second thing is um, we, are, we call ourselves a gateway fund. Um, what do you mean? So. Gateway Fund means bridging uh, Asian startups with Japanese large corporates. Since we are backed by Japanese uh, large corporate as a limited partner uh, with LPs, so uh, they are requesting us to uh, accelerate the collaboration between Japanese corporations and uh, Asian local startups. For example, one of the largest life insurance company, Mitsui Sumitomo Marine Capital, 
uh, is our LP. And also, uh, one of the largest uh, system integrators in Japan, Nihon Unisys, is our LP. Then um, we invested in 12 or 13 uh, Indian startups now, and one of them is uh, DocSep, online doctor, one of the, uh, the largest Indian online hospitals. And actually, Mitsui Sumitomo Life Insurance invested in DocSep just last month, actually. Then uh, one of another of our portfolio company, Let's Transport, it's an uh, uh, Uber business type of last mile logistics. And actually, we are, I'm very pleased to inform you that one of the, still confidential, but one of the largest automobile, industry, automobile companies, manufacturers in Japan, uh, decided to invest in Let's Transport. And also one of the largest trading company in Japan also follows investment, decided to follow the investment. So such kind of large scale collaboration between Japanese large corporate and the Indian startups, it's being realized very much. So we are trying to accelerate such kind of business collaboration. So um, lots of corp uh, corporates asking me, why you are focusing on Asian startups? That's a very good question. Of course, there are several reasons, right? I, th I think each person has its own uh, opinion, so I think let me uh, ask you later. But I think, of course, you know, ja Japanese market is now shrinking. No. We are suffering from the long depression, actually. So, but for example, India, I think it's, cam it, it's expected to grow for next 20 years with 8.5% GDP growth. And also Southeast Asia and China and other Asian countries are still grow keep growing. Um, but not only for the market size and growth rate, uh, we are focusing on technology and innovation. Have you ever heard about the concept leapfrog? Leapfrog, it's a very wonderful concept, right? So in Japan, for example, 20 years ago, we utilized, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we utilized a Pokebell, very uh, casual digital uh, I mean, uh, way of the communication. I think you don't know very much about it, but it's, it was a trend in Japan. Then PHS and the mobile phone introduced in the market. Then now we are using a smartphone. Then we are using a laptop, right? I oh, know, sorry, um, iPad, right? Tablet. But now India and Southeast Asia, every young people jump into the smartphone. So smartphone first country. There we can see lots of smartphone first countries, meaning that um, I the first time connected with the internet, not by laptop, desktop, computer, but smartphone. So I think a new type of business is emerging very much. So for example, online doctor, let me talk about uh, uh, one remarkable case. AI chatbot diagnosis, online doctor. Our portfolio company, DocSap, is again, as I mentioned, the largest online doctor in India. So lots of Japanese companies are getting interested in that sectors, but unfortunately we cannot utilize AI chatbot services in Japan. You know the reasons, right? Because of the regulation. And unfortunately, we don't have active Uber, Airbnb. No, it's not strictly allowed, but it's almost degraded actually. So strict regulations there in Japan, and also, as far as online doctor system concerned, doctor association, doctor union is strictly giving the objections to new, so, uh, new social innovation because of they're worried about losing their jobs, right? And also Japan is uh, infrastructure in the healthcare sector is very implemented. We have a rich infrastructure there. So I think we are not very much, I mean, obliged to consider Further innovation, further next level of the innovation. We are, we can say that we are to some extent satisfied with the current infrastructure systems. Unfortunately, that preventing our next level of innovation. But in India, there is no no, no regression. I think Rajiv San is very familiar with that systems, but uh, because you are from India, uh, they are from India. So, but less regressions, we can say. And lacking of the infrastructure, I mean incentivizing lots of startups to create something new in the industries. And also, of course, there is some doctor unions, doctor association, but less stronger. It's more calm, I think, compared with Japanese doctor association. So I can say that new types of social innovation is 
emerging now in India and other Asian countries. That's really inspiring to me. And some of the Japanese corporate also getting such interest. But how Japanese company can do, what Japanese company can do considering such circumstances? Because they, can not, they, can, they are not allowed to do anything in that sector in Japan. So some of the companies decided to invest in Indian and other Asian startups doing such kind of businesses. Wow. Of course, it can be allowed, right? Wow. Yeah. So my interest, the topic I would like to address here at this panel is how much beneficial, how much can be, is it possible, how much possible, how possible such kind of cross-border open innovation like investing in from Japanese large corporate to Asian startups to accelerate the new social ecosystems. What kind of tips, what kind of strategy we can consider? And what kind of role the government should take to accelerate further cross-border investment promotions and further cross-border open innovation? So, uh, as I mentioned, right, the right partners is trying to do, trying to rewrite more cross-border innovation between Japan and Asian countries. So, I'm very excited to be engaged in such kind of situations and hope to pass through the opinions and uh, try to discuss how, what, ca what can be done and what we can collaborate together to rewrite the further social innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you. May I now request Mr. Emil for his. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Emil from Indonesia. Actually, I'm from the, we call it IDS lab. So you can see the, the longest uh, terms in mean Indonesian digital entertainment art and sciences. So basically, uh, we, this is kind of a we call it an uh, independent research center. So we, we are basically from the university. I myself, I'm uh, teaching in one of the universities in Indonesia. So the idea is uh, we connect together. We, we, we thought about uh, setting up a new uh, center from the university. So we hope that uh, from, <coughs> from this uh, center, we can uh, try to contribute to the society. So basically, uh, we are seven founders and all of, all of us from different universities. So the, uh, we also come from different uh, disciplines and uh, uh, we mainly focus on uh, yeah, human and technology. So uh, the idea of having this, uh, we are trying because Indonesia is uh, one of the developed country and uh, one of the largest uh, population in Southeast Asia and also uh, have a lot of problems that uh, across the country we have uh, different uh, thousands of islands and each of them has different, their own problem and also the, the people itself, the, the culture, infrastructure and also the, the, the political issue. So <clears throat> knowing this, we, we, we believe that uh, we cannot offer a universal solution to everybody. So. Uh, in, in our lab, in IDS lab, we try to do some, uh, we, try, we start from the research. So as the research start, and then we try to give solution to the people, and uh, from that solution, we are going to commercialize, and hopefully it can be used nationwide. So one of the, the example that we are currently doing right now uh, in our uh, lab, we are collaborate with uh, some community to, uh, uh, to deal with the problem of uh, plastic waste, you know, Indonesia recently uh, be, uh, is on the news because we uh, there's some one uh, whale found dead, and it it has almost six kilogram plastic on on the stomach, and it found that in, in some place of uh, one island of Indonesia, and the government uh, also have uh, yeah huge homework for for handling the waste, and then. Uh, we found one community in one of the region in Indonesia. Uh, they are starting a, a movement called Waste Bank. So Waste Bank uh, basically is kind of commercial bank, but instead of depositing deposit money, people deposit waste. So people, uh, we encourage people to bring 
the the recycling waste yeah we uh, so they deposit to the waste bank and it exchange to money so they, they deposit gradually and at, at the time they can withdraw the money <coughs> or uh, they use the money to uh, to buy something so we create a system uh, using an IT system so uh, we also open uh, try open a marketplace so they can buy and purchase things from there and we also try to connect with uh, the government uh, because uh, most of the city also in Indonesia working with the smart city. So we hope by using this uh, uh, amount of money inside uh, their deposit, they can also use to, to get public uh, facility, like paying for the public transport from, uh, from the money they deposit from the waste. So we are, we are creating the system where we call, uh, continue collaboration uh, with the community. So we hope that uh, this idea is, even though it's only start from one small provinces in Indonesia, we hope this idea will be adopted across Indonesia uh, because uh, we had also some group of people start to organize the association of uh, uh, businessmen who are working on the waste management because uh, we have a recycling company, but they are not uh, organized in, in in good manner, so we are, uh, some of our friends try to organize this, and hopefully we also connect with some uh, uh, like business sector, uh, like the hospital, because in 2017 the, the, we found that uh, the hospital waste being thrown in the public place. So we found a needle in uh, in the public sp uh, space, and this has created a lot of problem. And the government also start to uh, do some uh, yeah, regulation on that one. And now we approach the different uh, hospital and also different uh, hotel, uh, resort, try to <coughs> help them uh, manage their, their waste also. So we are not only working on the uh, uh, household or domestic one, but we also try to connect with uh, some uh, business sector. So this, <coughs> and then our lab, uh, we, we support this movement because we believe that uh, this is something that we contribute to our society and also we have uh, yeah, the, the knowledge, because we are mainly as a uh, professor at the university, we, we have this responsibility. So that's basically what we are doing right now in Indonesia. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think doing some great work, uh, because it's not only about the tech startups, but if the startups could also look at the social issues and also the issues which impact the society in terms of managing waste, uh, water, traffic, many such issues. Thank you. Uh, may I now request uh, Mr. Sean Khan for his... Uh... Uh, hello, uh, I'm Sean. Uh, actually, on the brochure I'm from Korea, uh, Popo Games, actually I have two companies. Uh, one is the Popo Games, which is located in Singapore. Uh, uh, what I'm doing with this company is developing a game. Actually, I have a uh, studio in Ho Chi Minh City, just out there. Uh, I have a team. Uh, they develop a, a great game uh, with uh, uh, less, uh, I mean, less graphic quality uh, to compare uh, competitive in indie ma Indian market. Then working with the Indian uh, publishers to release in Indian market. Then the other one is, and uh, I have another company in Korea which is called Amnori which is uh, doing uh, VR and AR game development, mostly in sports. So what they do is that uh, having license from uh, global sports stars such as Manny Pacquiao, he's a legendary boxer of uh, Philippines, and getting his IP making a VR sports games, something like that. Uh, yeah, in terms of the entrepreneurship, um, uh, what I'd like to tell is that uh, it's about the risk management. Actually, it is everything that I'm learning from when I started the entrepreneurship journey uh, back to 2011. At the time, I, offered, I was offered a, a great job from a UK company called MediaFed. They offered the job as a country manager, and I started that job. So it was very successful. I had a, a great two years with them. And when I looked back, I, I saw in my bank, bank account, there are a, uh, a lot of money uh, to start a new business, so I thought that it was the right time to start my own business, so just like uh, just like other a lot of people. So at that time, it was not good money, uh, big money, but I was thinking it was a big money because 
Uh, at that time, I was, uh, I was paid by a sterling pound, UK pound. I had 200,000 pounds in my bank account, so I thought it was a big money. See? So I started the business and I spent all the money in six months. <laughs> 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 and then I was thinking that I was fucked up. <laughs> so, uh, I was uh, struggling to survive. Uh, at that time, uh, luckily, I didn't marry. Uh, so <laughs> I had a very tough two months. And, uh, Anyways, I was uh, luckily survived back, and then I could. I was thinking that, wow, it, 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 this, uh, the money was not enough for us to survive. So I was thinking, how too many is the risk? So at that time, after that, I started the outsourcing business. So uh, I, I was uh, I was a person. I became a person who uh, was more realistic. When I started the business, uh, just like David said, I was inspired by Steve Jobs. My dream was making my company to go out IPO. But right now, uh, uh, I do the business with uh, uh, partners to, uh, risk, uh, to manage my risk. In the case of Popo Games, uh, to, uh, to manage my cost, I don't hire a Korean team because they are so expensive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, instead of them, I'm hiring uh, uh, this uh, Vietnamese. Uh, in terms of the coding quality, they are uh, uh, the same with the Korean team, uh, but they offers me better uh, cost, so I hired them. And also, uh, 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 yeah, as a Korean, I can release my games in Korean market. But uh, as all of you maybe know, Korean market, Japanese market, Taiwanese market, Chinese market, it is too much. Hurt. <laughs> there are so many big companies that I yeah. cannot compete with. Right. So instead of them, I go to India, uh, the new market. It's like a hero science idea, just like hero science idea. And I released my first game in India, and uh, it was uh, back to 2015. <coughs> I was thinking I could be success, successful at that time because my, I was thinking my idea was perfect, but I failed again. But at that time, I didn't have a right market idea. I didn't have any partners in India. I did. I underestimated the cultural differences, and after that, I met the right partner in India. Luckily, uh, that is called Najara uh, Technology. So with them, I'm I'm releasing a great game, and yeah, this business is growing steadily. If it goes like a rocket, it can be better, but I don't expect that. Like the dream is just growing steadily. It's good enough. And with the uh, Amnori, uh, luckily, I realized another strategy is possible. So I got the uh, uh, investment of uh, VR manufacturer called Vibe. And getting uh, with their investment, I'm making VR games right now. When I started to uh, develop VR games, uh, I was thinking I can sell these games to on a Steam. Uh, I don't know whether you know Steam or not, but Steam is the global platform of selling games. So after selling the games on the Steam, I, again, I was thinking that I could be a billionaire again very quickly, but it was again failed. <laughs> uh, but the Steam platform was uh, strong enough, but uh, the, there's uh, not enough users who accept their VR games at that time. It was just last year. But also, I researched a lot. Uh, the new technology of Telco is coming. It is 5G. So uh, this 5G technology, I decide to embrace. So right now I'm working with KT, uh, the biggest telecom communication uh, company in Korea. Uh, so uh, the better thing is that uh, they are paying me uh, to develop my game. And they are getting, buying my games and selling through their networks. And better thing is that uh, uh, they are thinking acquiring my company after uh, two years. So what I'm thinking is that uh, it, it is just uh, happened by coincidence. But what I'm learning is that uh, getting better monies and getting better, uh, uh, having better strategy how to exit will be very important to manage the risks. So uh, throughout this experience, I uh, graded my businesses, uh, I mean, Herrick, I mean, uh, others. Uh, what is important to uh, less important? If I do the right, maybe I can go look for IPO if I'm very lucky. But even, even if I cannot go IPO right now, I have another B plan, uh, KT or other company. Uh, they are already uh, thinking about acquiring my company. Or third way, if that does not work, anyways, I can be surviving. <laughs> I know how to survive. <laughs> yeah, uh, what I'm thinking right now is that embracing, I mean, uh, 
embracing this entrepreneurship is very important for our young generation because uh, think about the other technologies, such as robotics, AIs, and uh, other things. Big corporations that they are uh, cutting their uh, manpowers. The people who lost the, uh, their, I mean, who lost their jobs, where they should go for, for uh, earning money is. I think eventually they all should do their own businesses. And in terms of the big companies, they also should grow, even if they don't have enough manpower. Uh, if, if they want growth, uh, they should embrace a new service, which will be developed by uh, entrepreneurs like us. Uh, that's, uh, that's what I'm going to say. Uh, risk management, and uh, we should sell our companies to big companies. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sean. I think uh, some very interesting uh, insights yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, the appetite to take risk. What if you fail? When do you, do, when do you start? And I think at the end you say that grow and sell. Uh, so these are all interesting sites. I think uh, we have uh, thrown many thoughts, ideas. So the floor is open now. Uh, we can take some comments, questions. Yes, madam. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just to address the first part of what you people said, it's an all-male panel. So I thought I might as well just pitch in as, as soon Absolutely. as you people finish you. and listen uh, after listening to all of you. I think one of the things that's very important today when we talk about entrepreneurship and um, David earlier spoke of people above 40, etc. Uh, I, I was a lawyer first and I started, I went to re-educate myself at the age of 34, 35 and then started all over again but the biggest bump was to raise funding and especially being a woman it was an extremely difficult job to find funds um, even if you were the best in the industry. So I had, I initiated one industry in India. Uh, from a very, very, and I was early in time. I had to get out of India again to start in a different place. And uh, uh, it, it, is, it is extremely crucial, like they said, the training for above 40s and for having women on board and uh, not just as entrepreneurs, but also as leaders. Uh, because we need that kind of input. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been throwing away his 200,000 pounds. Because we had a woman on board, she will not let you spend that kind of money and throw it away for something like that. Because they, usually, women have that knack for, uh, for looking at things from a very different perspective, from a very nurturing perspective, and not a very uh, male, which is more aggressive perspective. So I think it's a very important point that has been raised in the beginning, that we have to find a way to include more women in the entrepreneurship and the leadership segment. Um, and I'm, I, uh, uh, Emil, is this only in Indonesia? Atauri tampat line lagi This, sorry, this is Indonesian. I'm asking him if this is in also in Indonesia, in somewhere else also. Your, 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 uh, your project. Uh, currently, we start in Indonesia. Only in, in Indonesia. Yeah, okay. I think, but we we are open to yeah to expand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the, and the yeah. second point I want to make here uh, is that there's. So much tech happening just now. Uh, it's sad for the other projects, I think. Everybody, if, I, if, I, if I'm talking to venture capitalists and everybody, they want to include a level of tech or they want tech. So people who are doing other things are finding it very difficult to now get, uh, get their foot into this place, um, either by way of you know, putting the ideas across or even to raise funds for that, something which is different. So I'd love your thoughts on that. Uh, for people who are already doing it, and yours especially, I mean, because you're, you're into that space, I'd love to hear yeah. from you. Yeah, thank you very much. Good question and good opinion, I think. So, uh, yeah, I agree. Lots of venture capital is just looking for tech, mm. innovation. I think one of the reasons is because, of course, we are also backed by our investors, right? Yes. So I think we have to make a profit. Yes. Then we have to give it the money with profit, right? Okay. So I think such kind of, I mean, our investors are looking for some extent of profits. Of course, venture capital investment and the return of the investment can be expected to be huge, right? Yes. If successful. So I think, uh, I, th I think we have to change another as a concept or we have to create another scheme like already existing. So social investment fund scheme or so I think a different type of venture debt fund or venture capital fund should be more considered seriously. I agree with you at that point. So I think we have to set up that different part end of the fund. Any other? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I do have some uh, a quick question for the board as well. So first, I would like to 
asked about if do you have any advice for young people like um, uh, they want to start up the new company or something like that. What is the best way to rise and manage the fund and um, what is the best way to get to the success? And also, do every nation need a, um, um, a institute or a funding organization to support them when they got mistake and they don't have any more fund to start up again? So, I think, Sean, you should answer. You have failed thrice, <laughs> still fighting. <laughs> you are the best. So, uh, the question, uh, the question is, uh, where is the, where is the uh, good source to get? A bit louder. Uh, the, uh, the real question is, uh, where, where big good uh, source to get uh, funded uh, for young, gen uh, young entrepreneurs? Yeah, so correct. How to start? It's, yeah, it's really hard to uh, answer, <laughs> you know. <laughs> as every situation is different. In my case, I just go to the bank. When I ran out of money, <laughs> I just went to the bank. <laughs> yeah. I ask, I, yeah. Actually, a uh, bank doesn't give you money. Uh, I realized that when I go, went to the bank, uh, that I, I was very close to the bankers, and he said that uh, uh, in terms of your credit, you can get uh, credit card service I did. So credit card service money was not enough. I just, uh, uh, my allowance at that time was just about uh, five thousand dollars. It was not enough money to survive, so I went back to uh, my father. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So the, the best money uh, for young people, I think, is family money. I can tell you. Uh, so go to the father. Uh, you know, I I had a really good pitch to my father. <laughs> And the uh, first time uh, he rejected, and after that, uh, uh, we made an agreement with my father, and uh, uh, he uh, lent, uh, lent us some money. But the good thing, when you get uh, money, uh, money from your father, uh, you don't need to uh, 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 pay back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that is uh, the first good money. So go to your uh, father. And second thing is just like other uh, insurance sellers, uh, go to your friends. <laughs> oh. Maybe you will lose your friend, but you should try. <laughs> uh, that that will be uh, a better way. And then uh, once you feel that your uh, business is growing, uh, then you can approach like uh, venture capital, like uh, Hirozang or other people. But still, the better way is to find uh, uh, your own clients. Uh, that is uh, better. Uh, that, uh, that's what I've learned. So uh, uh, all about uh, managing how to uh, just risk, less, uh, risk less. Yeah. So get good money. Go to your father. <laughs> <laughs> just chip in a little bit here. Yeah. So, so what do you think about my second point? About uh, every, every nation should have an organization to support young people to start up. Like the funding organization for every country. Like such as in Asia. Uh, can you speak it again uh, a little bit? Uh, so, do you think my opinion on like creating a organization for every country mm -hmm. that uh, organization organization will support funding for every people who would like to start up the right way? Mm -hmm. is, is that a good or bad idea? Would you give me some opinion about that? I'll just uh, respond to this. I think uh, most of the countries have uh, such organizations. Okay. and uh, which are supported by the government and there are also many private institutions like in India uh, government of India runs a huge startup initiative they also have a startup fund uh, there are some banks who support there is uh, a small scale bank which also has uh, a startup fund so uh, and lots of academic uh, institutions have the startup cells, incubation centers. So I'm sure uh, uh, such institutes already exist, but definitely there is a need to uh, maybe scale up, do more, uh, work from the grassroots. Sure. You were adding. Yeah, just now I just uh, want to respond to you about how, to, how the young people want to start up. Uh, and also, at the same time, he mentioned the MIT report, um, 45 years old, very likely you'll be successful. Um, let me try to answer in one shot. My, my, my experience, basically, it is uh, uh, it sh 
a startup actually is to be consists of uh, uh, the young and the more experienced uh, uh, co-founders. When I have the first startup, actually I'm 39. My CTO actually is 26 years old, right? Uh, he was already a principal consultant of one of the largest software company in the world at the age of 26, flying around and all this. Very good talent, doesn't have a degree, it's just a polytechnic graduate. One of the sort of a cyber security uh, guru, you know, at his age, at the age of 26. But he has been starting up using the computer, not for hacking, but cyber security at the age of 14. He started very young. My second startup, uh, I did it in 2008. My another co-founder is also 26 years old. And my CTO is uh, 35 years old, PhD in artificial intelligence. So the combination, why I believe that this, this kind of mixture of uh, combination of young and a more experienced co-founder is very important. Let me give you an example. When Google actually uh, got the first funding, right, uh, serious funding back in 1999, year 2000, they don't believe the two guys actually would be able to scale the company. So that's why they got Eric Smith himself also is a, as a uh, investor. He became the CEO. Only after 10 years later, when the two co-founders become more mature, then they take back. So Eric Smith became the chairman. That is just one example. Now for the MIT report, actually it is, they didn't tell you that because they only take the oldest co-founder of the company but they also have other younger co-founders you didn't mention. <laughs> so always in the company, it is have a young and also the more senior one combined together. The reason actually it is the VC, when they look at and evaluate the deal, when I wear my VC hat as well, because I also did invest, do investment, is I want to look at it whether the team can scale or not. Can you execute? If you, if you are selling an enterprise software, no matter how good it is, so very it is, but this bunch of people, they're so young, they haven't even seen a lot of big system implementation. So it's very difficult to convince the, you know, the, the, the investor to put in a lot of money. So that is why I, I would recommend you know, a combination of young and, and most experienced co-founder and come together as a team. Oh, oh, thank you very much for that. So can I have just one little more question? So, as I know that uh, in Vietnam, we don't have any organization to support young people. Um, what do you think about my idea that, uh, like, in Asia, 10 countries or 11 countries can go together and, like, making like, one funding for all of the people in Asian country? Is that a good idea, or can you give some opinion for us? Point, right? Because I was involved in uh, some of this uh, government uh, funding scheme, uh, I involved in some of the investment committee and grant committee as well. Grant means, you know, they give you money without any equity in return, whether it's for social enterprise and all that. They never think that it is only for the young people. From the country point of view, I don't think they can say, you know, I only support the young. Then the, old, then the older one like me is like, why are you discriminating me? <laughs> you know? I think it's a landmine. I think if you want to do that, it should be actually for all. <laughs> That's my two cents. Okay, thank you very much for that. Yeah, I think ASEAN uh, definitely is uh, looking at all these things because uh, last month I was at uh, the ASEAN Secretariat in Jakarta. So they do have uh, a a larger vision, what they call Impact uh, 2025, and Startup is one of the team, and uh, the digital economy is also one of the theme. So I'm sure uh, they'll be happy to have, uh, but again, it needs the consensus from all the 10 countries. Yeah, thank you. Any other? Uh, from, yes. Mr. Chairman, my name is Dr. J.S. Junija. We, I think uh, the subject is very relevant, accelerating uh, entrepreneurship. <clears throat> I think in this context, I think we should mention about incubation. 
which is very important. And I think uh, many countries have done a lot of work in incubation. India, particular Ministry of Science and Technology, had set up what you call the steps, Science and Technology Entrepreneur Park. Basically, they are based on uh, promoting enterprise in the high-tech areas. <coughs> Technology and sciences, basically. I've been associated with the advisory board chairman also on that uh, center. But uh, I think in addition to that, what is happening is uh, the many institutions, particularly the management institutions, particularly the engineering colleges and universities, because you need a uh, some institutional framework to support these steps. Some te technology enterprise or other incubation centers. There has to be professional support. <coughs> I think that part we have to recognize that uh, in order to accelerate entrepreneurship, this is one of the areas to do it. So that I thought I should sure. intervene in this. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comment or view? Any suggestion? Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Tim Colby. I'm from uh, California, but the last 10 years living in, in Singapore. Um, one of the comments I guess I would have in, in, in the topic area here is the idea, um, I, I would say beware of best practices. <laughs> I know most consultants don't say that very often, but the best way to make someone else a leader is to become a follower. And I think it's important to take risk, it's important to try things. Uh, yesterday I heard in, in one of the sessions someone talking about uh, looking at the five other models that existed to emulate, and the one that they left out was creating a new one. And I think it's important, important to not be, don't look at the ground too much. Look out ahead, make sure you're, you're trying some things that are very specific to what this region offers as opportunities. If you look at Alipay and uh, WeChat Pay, the opportunity that came from that for that business was very distinct to that region and to that market. And it was a very inventive change compared to say what you would find in the US or Europe or other places. So I would say have, have the nerve to step up and, and take a leadership position in some of these new ideas. And you don't have to look always for precedent. Use, use the creativity. And I think you have also a very broad uh, range of opportunities that fall out of that. Absolutely, great input. Yes, thank you. Any other uh, comment? Yes. Hi. Uh, I have a question. Um, do you think the traditional way of uh, doing VC, PE investments work in light of emerging technology and also how social changes are accelerating so fast? Um, is that, does that model even work anymore? For example, a VC or PE guy comes in, uh, okay, we want, you know, two board seats for X amount of money and, you know, free money, blah, 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 and then that's it. They sign a deal, the VC and PE, they walk away now the entrepreneur is left holding the bag. I mean, does that model work anymore? Uh, just a very good question too. Thank you very much, Bhairam. So, um, as far as my understanding, it still can work to some extent, because, uh, but I think under some conditions, right? I think, for example, uh, as far as the Indian concerned, I think 2013 to 2014, uh, SoftBank, uh, Japanese companies, right, as they already mentioned uh, earlier. So they s did lots of huge amounts of investments. Then that targeted sector was e-commerce and the Alipay type, the Paytm FinTech, and also mobility transportation services like Uber, Indone in Indian Uber, Ola Cab. So I think most of the targeted sectors were time machine time machine types of a business, already existing in somewhere else over the world, like Silicon Valley in the US. So such kind of investment in emerging markets, time machine business investment in emerging market, I think that can work well because uh, uh, foreign VCs and uh, some of the VCs locals uh, whose fund managers uh, have some experience in the US. For example, in India, lots of Indian people, portfolio managers have experience working in India, oh no, US. So I think that kind of investment can uh, be suitable, I mean, uh, with uh, uh, traditional types of VC and P investment. But as you mentioned, new types of business, 
like a leapfrog type of business and also high tech type of business. It's more evolving rapidly. So I think we have to consider more. The, if, if we continue uh, doing some kind of investment with uh, current schemes, current structure, but even then, I think we have to, I mean, consider further, I mean, decision making schemes and further evaluate, uh, better evaluate, more effective evaluation schemes, assessing schemes, because I think we have to consider unknown fields, right? More, I mean, with under uncertainty. So I think we have to consider more, but I think my conclusion is to some extent, I think still uh, current way of investment by venture capital and the pay fund can work well. So I don't know other and entrepreneurs think about it. I mean, I have a fund actually together with some of our partners, about 16 partners. We're all entrepreneurs and we see our own personal money. We invest about 22 companies since 2012. All sit around, about half million dollars each deal. And um, I, I observed that actually it is, uh, there are two challenges in the last five years. One, it is the uh, crowdfunding, um, people actually grow to the public in a way, by and large actually in trying to get the money collectively. Because you're talking about half million or one million dollar, it is not difficult to reach. I'm talking about those seed money or even pre-series pre A. So this is a big challenge actually, it is uh, the, the, the VC actually facing. The other one, it is uh, uh, just now, uh, Sean mentioned, you know, you go to your father, you know, and you look at that, you know, now a lot of parents actually pretty well off also. They are willing to park a few hundred thousand actually for the, for the, for the children actually to take risks and all that. So that's why, you know, the VC or the, uh, the fund actually have to work extra hard. The entrepreneur will be extremely selective now, meaning that, you know, they don't want dumb money. They want value the money. That means, you know, you want to, I mean, I'm, not, I'm talking about good deal. Right? I mean, if it is not good deal, nobody will invest. If it is a good deal, the VC have to go and basically beg. Can I invest? Can we invest in your deal? So it's the other way around. If it is not a good deal, you don't need to talk to the VC. The VC won't talk to you also. So it is it's a by elimination. And... So that's why, you know, I, I would say that in, uh, the, the VC have to work extra hard actually to get a good deal in and uh, to value act. For example, uh, I want to go into a China market. Can you bring me inside? Can you, can you bring me to the Indian market? It's not like, you know, I give you a million dollar or two million dollar. Then, you know, that's it. You know, I will come for a bot seat and then you give me a, every month, you give me a financial report and a few phone call and all that. No such thing anymore, <laughs> especially for young startup. Um, just to follow Great. up on Hero, um, I'm with a uh, Quan Capital regional PE firm based in Shanghai, uh, partner and general counsel for them. Uh, one of the things that we are starting to do is, is you, you mentioned uh, how, do, how does one cooperate between the big corporation and a small startup. And one, one of the ways that we are looking at is we're getting technology, mature technologies from the big corporations. And Dentsu is also our LP. Uh, uh, and then we're taking mature technologies and partnering um, with startups and in, in st strategic locations um, in ASEAN. So that way it goes back to Eddie's point about you have maturity, uh, at test proven technology from a big uh, company. Um, and then we, after, we, roll, we not only are just board directors on, on the entrepreneurial level, we actually roll up our sleeves and we, we're in the front lines as well. Because why? It's to manage change. You know, we, we, you can't sit on the board um, and then three months later look at what happened the past quarter. I mean, it's already history, it's gone. Um. Sure, sure, please. Yeah, thanks for, yeah, yeah for, I appreciate adding very good point, right? Between, so I think basically, for example, from, I mean, the comparison between Japan and Asian market, especially India and Southeast Asia, we are aging society, <laughs> and we are depressing, right? Then, but you are the young um, population, society, and also emerging. 
And also, as, you may, as he correctly mentioned, we have, uh, Japan has uh, well competitive hardware technology and mature technologies, but India and for example, Vietnam too, lots of, I mean, uh, coming up at a high tech side, right? IT, AI, IoT technologies. And also we have, uh, I mean, for example, what? Yeah, sorry, we ha and also Japan still had uh, abundant monies, <laughs> retained earnings. Especially large corporate has a lots of cash in the bank, <laughs> at bank. Do you know the interest rate in Japan now? Almost zero. Yeah. No reasons, <laughs> right, to, uh, to cash for outside. So, but now Japan and uh, India and Vietnam and the Southeast Asian startups seek funds, seeking funds very much. So I think uh, considering such kind of conditions and circumstances, I think we have to consider more seriously about the bridging large corporate in Japan and uh, maybe China and Korea too, with uh, emerging Asian startups. Yeah. Sure. Any other comments? <laughs> Suggestions? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like very much what my uh, fellow female listener said about representing women here. I'm always uh, in favor of that. Um, but I really liked a, a point that I think um, David made about mentoring and we're all talking now about investment and as if only investment and money will fix this entrepreneur problem of taking risk. Only if you have enough money and then you're willing to take this risk and you will be successful. I do not think so. I think there should be something that I just wrote down myself as a knowledge investment that actually young entrepreneurs need mentors and guidance of corporates, maybe Japanese, you name it, companies that would be willing to invest with their knowledge to raise up smaller company. It can be, yes, social impact, but it might be even for a financial value. It's just a, some kind of different investment because I think um, I'm also a, a startup um, of a co-working space that focuses on women. Um, and you need more than that. You need more than your own money, your own experience, your own younger, older co-founder. You need someone from outside who has seen another picture, the bigger picture, or something totally different to bring to the table. So I would like to have your view on how do you foster in your big, small organizations a spirit of innovation, knowledge sharing, mentoring. I have seen, uh, in fact, I've been invited in uh, quite a few of, even for big organizations, uh, for their own accelerator program. Um, and I've seen um, independent accelerator program, that means the incubator. Uh, I can talk a little bit on the Singapore side, there's quite a number of incubators. Um, they take probably even banks also, they have their own incubator program. Uh, for example, DBS Bank, UOB Bank, some they don't take equity, some they take equity. Uh, in general, it's about 6 to 8% if they take equity. That means they nurture you for maybe about six months. They will match your idea uh, with mentors. The mentors actually, for example, if you talk about fintech, they, because they're a bank, they definitely know who actually is in the game. Uh, they are bankers. And the more important thing actually is the bank, I'm just talking about fintech, right? The bank actually, they have data. So you want to play around actually, of course they analyze, analyze it, but uh, you have a good sandbox type of uh, uh, you know, environment for you to test your idea. You're being uh, assigned to a mentor or group of mentors and all that. So it is, uh, I would say, it's one of the pretty well-proven method, method uh, you know, adopted at least in Singapore. I've seen other organizations, they themselves have the uh, uh, incubator uh, program. The reason actually it is uh, because instead of losing the talent the inside, I mean, that means the colleagues, some of the colleagues, they want to go outside to start their own company. So they encourage entrepreneurship now. So uh, in fact, I, I just joke with, uh, uh, not joke, la, but I, I, I was invited to speak in uh, a few companies. One company actually gave me a book 
uh, because there's a theme for the management team retreat for about 80 people. So the book is named called uh, Build to Last. It is by uh, about 20 years ago, you know, by some, some the, the, the few guy from Shell. And then, then I said, I think you got the wrong guy. I built to sell. <laughs> but, then, but then actually, joke aside, actually, I still be the speaker there. And uh, why? It's because they want to encourage the colleagues within the organization, don't go outside. I'm going to assign you to become a specific business unit. They still call SBU. I give you the funding. You are the CEO of that unit. And I give you the customers. In fact, who started it? SAP. Surprising, right? SAP started it a few years ago. So I met up with the executive VP in charge of the program. And they have a few centers around the world which encourage SAP colleagues, don't leave. You know, leave it inside. So organization is doing that, getting more and more doing it. And also, uh, 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 you know, independent incubators are also doing it. Absolutely, mentorship, it is very important. So the incubators are doing the job. Eddie, just a follow-up question on that. Uh, can you share more about the remuneration or incentive scheme for this kind of intrapreneurship? Are they getting some sort of equity to sweeten the deal to keep them on board? Yeah, I, it's quite interesting. The, uh, uh, if I may share, you know, uh, not a specific company, but I can share with you, you know, some formula. First of all, they will give you the capital. It depends on the, uh, 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 how big is your project, right? So if you say that, you know, this is my projection and all that, and you want to raise funds as if, you, as if you're independent. That means, you know, you don't say that uh, you work for my company, okay? That means if you want to go out and raise, what will be your business plan, okay? And you say you want to raise $2 million. I say, fine, I will give you $1 million, but office space is free of charge. All the colleagues, it's existing colleagues, I, s I send it to you, okay? And 18 months is the deadline. 18 months meaning that, you know, you will have the product up and running. You have to get the first sales because you don't need to do selling because all the, all the customer is already here in a way. You know, you act on, you know, you want to act something, right? And, uh, and within, after 18 years, uh, sorry, 18 months, then, you know, they probably will do a follow-up funding. They will have timelines for you. And then, you know, if it is successful, maybe about four years time, they will buy it back. They will buy it back. That means you know you can exit with a huge profit. Okay. Very interesting. Any uh, more suggestion, question, remark? Uh, since we have uh, time now, I think we can have uh, just one-liner comment from each one of you to say what probably the government can do and what maybe the individuals have to do. So can we start with you, David? Uh, sorry, can you, can you start with your question again? I... Basically, uh, what the government should do and the what the individuals could do. Individuals could do. Oh. Startups, the individual startups. Um, uh, I'm not very f familiar with the uh, uh, scenario in, in India, but I, I, will, I will start with uh, my experience in Taiwan. So, um, our government is pretty slow for the for the startup. So they are like trying to making plans like th this year only. So uh, our new our new government trying to uh, they have a new plan for setting up unicorn. They wanna they wanna build a unicorn for the next. They want to uh, create two unicorn companies in the next six years. So uh, this, that's their plan. But uh, what, what are they offering on the table? I don't think that's, that, that's pretty enough to, to create unicorn companies. So I think the government should uh, talk to more um, uh, startups founders, not, 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 the, not the one that's already being successful, but th those one who is fighting to become successful. Sure, sure. Yeah, just a brief comment. Okay. Uh, reality is that 
governments, they have their own problems, a lot of problems. Don't expect too much is something I like to say. I mean, you fight for your own startup and make your startup competitive and attractive. This is the key. Great. Thank you. Eddie? Um, <clears throat> we get the government. I think Singapore government is way, 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 way too proactive. <laughs> They've been doing very, uh, a, lot of, a lot of work and, uh, on that. I, but I totally agree with uh, Joseph and this. Um, don't expect the government will do everything for you. At the end of the day, easy money come, it will make you sort of like uh, complacent. So the, at the end of the day, you have to make sure that your company, your startup, highly, highly competitive. Sure. Not me? Okay. Yes. Yeah, I think the government, the government should, in simple word, I think they should understand the difference, I think. So very logical operator and government basically, as they are very conservative and in the long history. So, but the startup systems and the emerging markets and the emerging technology are totally different what they are, I mean, what the government have experienced. So I think to understand that to, I mean, admit and accept the difference is a very important point. Yeah. Sean. Okay, uh, as a Korean startup, I'd like to talk to the Korean government, even if uh, no one is from there now. Anyways, uh, actually, uh, uh, the uh, Korean society is uh, struggle with uh, 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 jobless. Uh, there are a lot of unemployed persons. Uh, so the uh, Korean government is supporting a lot of taxes. Uh, the taxes that I'm paying, uh, they are uh, hiring a lot of government officers. I think is use our monies uh, for no reason. If I were government, I'd like to push uh, big corporations like Samsung, Hyundai, or SKT to buy competitive startups uh, with giving them the tax benefits <laughs> so that uh, stimulating the ecosystem is actually this my selfish reason I'd like to send my companies to them. And uh, the other thing uh, is that I had a very... <laughs> Uh, my company, Amnery got an investment from uh, HTC Vive uh, as foreign company. Uh, that was last year. You know, but uh, as a foreign invest investor, it is really hard to invest, make an investment to, uh, to Korean companies. It was last year, but officially uh, they were uh, uh, registered as an investor in this year. There are a lot of paperwork, more than 100 papers I should supply. <laughs> so it is really... Uh, really um, and useless time I spent. And so yeah, maybe, I, I don't know about the other government, but uh, to Korean government, uh, you should work well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Emil? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think from Indonesia, I think uh, regarding uh, the government, I think, uh, I think they, are, they, do, they are gradually doing well because uh, I think recently in Indonesia, this year we have four unicorns. Uh, globally, I think it's quite a uh, good uh, progress so far. But however, uh, I think we need to di diversify the focus of uh, each startup. Uh, so we're not only focusing on the uh, say the business side or uh, like the tech side. So uh, and also we we hope that uh, government try to use this uh, this kind of startup movement to to give some uh, let's say some solution to the society because. Uh, we need this, uh, yeah, especially in our country, in our region, and in terms of the uh, the size of the nation, the population, and the, the ge geographic things. And then uh, I think we, this is something that uh, should be done by the government: more diversity and also more more support in terms of uh, uh, not centralized, because mostly now we centralized in one island, Java Island. I think Java is also one of the most populated island in the world. Just found out, and then I think uh, this is something that should be done. Right. Sure. Thank you. So I think we had a great session, plenty of insights, and uh, I'm sure uh, you all have uh, good takeaways. So may I request all of you to please uh, have a round of applause for the wonderful panel. And with this, we close. Thank you.